Hey hey, it's JK, Leeds. Welcome back. After completing all three magic challenges on one character in Dark Souls 1 through the use of New Game Plus cycles, today I attempt to do a similar sort of thing with Dark Souls 3. Compared to Dark Souls 1, I've heard quite a few times that magic isn't actually very good in this game, so time for me, a British guy with access to both a computer and a games console, to find out. I have made a bit of a change to the order though, as you can probably see on the thumbnail, so this time round, New Game will be Sorcery, New Game Plus will be Miracles, and New Game Plus Plus will be Pyromancy. Why the change up? Well, two reasons. First, in Dark Souls 3, Pyromancy actually scales with intelligence and faith, so it just made sense to do this as the third in the chain after doing Sorcery and Miracles which only scale with intelligence and faith respectively. Secondly, unlike Sorcery and Miracles, I actually have used Pyromancy in Dark Souls 3 before, and in fact have beaten the game using just them, so it makes sense to put the one I'm the most familiar with under the most difficult of conditions. One further intrigue to add to this run, I have never entered New Game Plus in Dark Souls 3 at all, so I have no idea what to expect difficulty wise. Now, before we dive in, let me address one elephant in the room. I'm sure there'll be a bunch of comments asking, what about doing this challenge in Dark Souls 2? Well, I do definitely want to do that, but it's not only the longest of the Dark Souls trilogy, but it also has four types of magic, so I'd have to do four playthroughs to complete it, and to be honest, I'm just not quite ready to play Dark Souls 2 four times in a row yet, from either a time spent or mindset perspective. I promise I will do it someday, just not yet. So anyway, back to the run at hand. Rules are simple. New game must be beaten with sorcery only, then I move to new game plus with a basic miracle casting tool and one basic miracle, beat that cycle with miracles only, and then do the same when I move to new game plus plus, but with pyromancy. If there's rings or armor which will be useful across multiple cycles, such as the sage ring for example, I'll let myself carry them over to avoid repetition of having to go get them again. I'll also let myself carry over any upgrade materials I've picked up, but I'm not allowed to specifically buy and stock up on them before moving to the next cycle. Lastly, no respecking of any stats because that's kind of cheating. Let's do this. So before you say it, yes, you're right. That is indeed Ian McKellen reprising his role as Gandup from the Elden Lord of the Rings. Write down in the comments below what you think I offered Ian McKellen to appear in this video and the winner will probably get a triangle shaped swish chocolate. And if you keep watching and don't comment an answer to this, Ian McKellen will be sad. Do you want Ian McKellen to be sad? Huh? Do ya? As we're doing sorcery, sorcerer is the obvious choice. Let me make one quick adjustment here. Ah, okay, much better. We start with both Soul Arrow and Heavy Soul Arrow, but only one Ashen Estes Flask at this point. It's a shame I couldn't get more casting speed by leveling up my U Dexterity before this boss, but it didn't matter too much. Actually, Soul Arrow looked kind of bad to start, but then Heavy Soul Arrow just absolutely crushed him, and our first boss is down. I head into Firelink Shrine, placing the Coiled Sword, and leveling up our intelligence stat for three whole points. With zero dillying nor dallying, I head into High Wall of Lothric, where the Dark Souls gods punish me for making that casting speed joke earlier. I free Grey Rat this time to get the blue Tearstone Ring, and then head to take on our next boss, Vort. Even though his defenses are strong like a walking Vortress, Heavy Soul Arrow does good damage, and the blue Tearstone Ring actually does save us from death here, allowing us to pull out the victory. I decided not to glass cannon myself, and actually did pop a couple points into Vigor before we head down to the Undead Settlement. Or at least that would be what we'd do if I hadn't completely forgotten to grab the damn banner. With it now in my inventory, we can say En Voyage and float on down like a butterfly in the moonlight. Yo, yo, what you saying? You wanna give me some free levels? Well, that'd be wonderful. He does actually serve another purpose here, which is that he sells Soul Greatsword, a sweet spell which I can afford after selling some useless armor. This spell summons a huge magic greatsword from the end of my staff to slice through enemies, basically a melee style spell. This will come in very useful, I feel. I free Cornix just because I might as well grab the stuff needed for the later cycles now and make a beeline to the Road of Sacrifices. After a couple of obviously purposeful deaths to this knight, I can now get another level from Yol, this time putting a point into Attunement which levels up both our FP and our spell slots this time round. There's also a couple of quite useful items we can grab in Road of Sacrifices, namely the Heretic's Staff, 
meaning more damage for our spells, and the Sage's Ring, which means we can cast our spells more quickly. On top of this, we can also send the most crucial NPC for sorcery to Firelink, this being Orbeck of Vinheim. He thinks we're at his Orbeck and call, but really, we're just using him. With that all sorted, we can now head through the obligatory Poison Swamp area, which luckily we can get out of the way early, as it's not that far on into the game. Luckily, it does have some pretty useful stuff for our build, including two scrolls, the Sage's Scroll and the Golden Scroll, as well as the Dream Chaser's Ashes, which will let us purchase infinite Titanite Shards from that Shrine Maiden. This is handy because unlike in Dark Souls 1, casting tools actually need to be upgraded. With both scrolls given to Orbeck, we can now purchase a number of things, but most notably, what I hear is arguably the most OP spell in the game, Pestilent Mist. I need a bit more intelligence to be able to use it, but I'm excited to give this a crack after hearing so much about it. I also bought Faron Dot, which I can use now, but uh, yeah, it kind of sucks. Lastly, in a move I could have made a lot earlier but forgot to, I went and grabbed the Covetous Silver Serpent Ring and then farmed until I could buy more Titanite Shards to level up my staff. With this all done, I grabbed Faron Flash Sword and Great Heavy Soul Arrow for faster and heavier damage, made myself into a pretty princess, and finally decided to stop messing around and fight the boss that I know you're all waiting to see, the Curse Rotted Greatwood. Everyone's favourite. Now, thankfully, this was pretty fine. Soul Greatsword, which is effectively like having a normal melee sword attack, made this no more difficult than usual, especially if you keep baiting the attack where our friend Woody here stands up and falls on his front. This boss's bark is definitely worse than its bite, although I have a feeling that if I had to actually try to free aim spells at his balls, this wouldn't be very fun at all. Okay, okay, let's actually do the Abyss Watchers now. So by this point, my damage was pretty good. I did initially go with the melee approach of Soul Greatsword, but switched to Great Heavy Soul Arrow partway through to see how that worked out, and it was a lot better honestly. The damage was high, and it didn't take too many to give this boss an Abyss Direct to me. Wind it up and watch her go. With the souls we'd now gathered, I got myself up to 30 int, and then recorded next to no footage of the Catacombs of Carthus, because this place sucks and doesn't deserve my attention. Walnir. Well, after smashing his bracelets with Soul Greatsword, this titanic skeleton sinks down. Walnir, far, wherever you are. Before anything else, I'm going to head to Smouldering Lake, primarily because of the large titanite shards that frequent this area. With these gathered now, we can get our staff up to plus 6, which is pretty nice. This area is also home to the old Demon King, who's a good candidate to see how good Pestilent Mist is. And it turns out, yeah, it's pretty damn good. If you get them to stay in that cloud, there really isn't a whole lot they can do. Also, look at the pitiful damage Great Heavy Soul Arrow and Soul Greatsword do to this guy in comparison. There's just no competition when it comes to damage here. This old king's channel just got demonetized, and we get a fat chunk of souls for our troubles. Seeing how strong Pestilent Mist was, I made what could be considered a controversial decision. I decided to see if I could take out Dancer early. I mean, all the Titanite chunks are hidden behind her, so if I can manage to get past, we can upgrade our staff very thoroughly and hopefully give ourselves an easier ride through. Pestilent Mist itself, however, doesn't actually scale with our staff or our stats. It always just deals a percentage of the enemy's total health while they stand in it, which means that even late game bosses can be hurt a lot by at this point. I keep luring Dancer into the mist over and over, and with a quick soul arrow to finish, Dancer departs from this corboreal realm. With Int leveled to 41, and Attunement at 21, I grabbed a number of chunks from the Consumed King's Garden and from Lothric Castle. I upgraded our staff to plus 9, and decided to test out my new power on one of the earlier bosses, the Crystal Sage, for a magic versus magic battle. A really interesting thing I found is that using just Pestilent Mist doesn't trigger the Sage to teleport at all until we get it below half health. From here, I can destroy the clones and then repeat the same trick with Pestilent Mist, meaning it never teleports and never summons any more clones. Some sage advice there if you ever want to use sorcery yourself for this boss. You know what? Screw it, I'm going to do Dragon Slayer armor right now as well. It's a pretty straightforward matter of getting him to chase you around the fountain in the middle, luring him into the Pestilent Mist. But guess what? For some reason, killing him this way doesn't trigger the second phase at all, so the butterflies never get involved with their projectiles. This spell is honestly ridiculous, and soon enough, this boss needs to go see an Armortician. At this point, 
I decided to start putting some points in Faith, as I'd need at least 20 to start the New Game Plus cycle, and it was already taking a lot to level up now. I actually thought I could go straight into the Grand Archives, but I forgot that the key doesn't appear till we clear the other Lords of Cinder. So, let's head to Cathedral of the Deep. Thank God for door opening iframes. Here, we snipe this giant, grab Lloyd's sword ring, and open the shortcut door before taking on the Deacons of the Deep, and I'm feeling pretty confident about this. Soul Greatsword's wide sweep is awesome for taking out multiple Deacons at once, and when Phase 2 begins, I cast Pestilent Mist where the main one is spawning. The combo of these two spells is devastating, and we absolutely deconstruct this boss's defences for the easy win. We can now head up to Erythil, and I think with our current setup, we can blast through some of the upcoming challenges. Erythil Dungeon is actually our first stop, because I need to jailbreak through this door, and then grab the Bellowing Dragoncrest Ring, giving us an even larger boost to sorcery damage. As I made my way to the profaned capital, I was chased to the very ends of the earth by this very irratating rodent, but thankfully he was defeated by a narrow entryway. Before I attempt Yorm, I outsource this sorcerer to get Logan Scroll and buy Soul Arrow. So probably the big question on your mind is, will Pestilent Mist work on Yorm? The answer is definitely yes. Despite having a giant health bar, the mist melts through it just like anyone else, letting us change up the usual Yormation this fight follows. It takes quite a few, but after about 5 minutes of fighting, another Lord of Cinder bites the dust or maybe bites the ash. Anyway, I purchased Oral Decoy to try and help me get through the staircase from hell, but turns out it was a total waste and didn't help me in the slightest. So, yeah, great. But anyway, onwards and upwards to Pontiff Sullivan. Now I had some pretty good luck here which gave me a solid Sullivantage against him. When he was creating his shadow, I cast Pestilent Mist, and luckily they decided to remain in place doing a projectile attack after the shadow appeared. This meant they stayed in the mist long enough for it to kill the shadow, and thus letting me finish off Pontiff with some Soul Spears. We're really crushing through these bosses. Soul Spears decent damage combined with Pestilent Mist is a hard combo for anyone to handle it seems. On my way to Aldrich and Anolondo, I had this weird thing happen where the spider-like creature that drops from the ceiling just died without me doing anything. I have no idea why, I didn't even see as I was turning the lever to open the door, but yeah, weird. As for Aldrich himself, well, I can tell you for sure I definitely didn't die twice when Aldrich was low on health. Nope, that definitely didn't happen. The arrow rain attack is very annoying, particularly the phase 2 variant, but conversely, Aldrich tends to stay in one place for a long periods of time, allowing Pestilent Mist to do what it does best. This is a true rags to Aldrich's story being told in real time, ladies and gentlemen. With all the other bosses on the way removed, we can now get into the Grand Archives, and for once, I need to actually kill this annoying Crystal Sage, as we want the Crystal Scroll he drops. Pestilent Mist is once again the MVP, as killing him using this stops him from teleporting, and thus makes it a lot easier. We can now grab the classic Crystal Soul Spear for even more damage, and who knows, maybe I'll even use it instead of just spamming Pestilent Mist. I actually did use it to take out the Outrider Knight, who guards Soul Stream, the prototype version of Comet Azor from Elden Ring. I actually found in practice that this wasn't actually that great or worth the FP cost. So, the Twin Princes. This was actually the first fight that presented a bit of difficulty. They teleport around too much for Pestilent Mist, so some other offensive spells would be needed. I decided to quickly run and grab the Court Sorcerer's Staff back from the Profane Capital, which I, uh, yeah, hon honestly completely forgot about. Am I, am I literally the worst challenge runner ever? I grabbed some more chunks from this area, as well as a slab, and saw this knight have a totally weird reaction to Pestilent Mist. He turns all the way round, but somehow doesn't see me and just stands there melting to death. What? Anyway, with the plus 10 Court Sorcerer's Staff, I definitely didn't choke at the last second by running out of FP. Twice. Crystal Soul Spear has a very high FP cost, so I had to use a clever combo of this with Pestilent Mist to get the win. My strategy was thus. Take out Lorien with 5 Crystal Soul Spears, then cast Pestilent Mist over them while Lothric does the revive. While this damages Lothric as well, it also reduces Lorien's health just about enough so 2 Crystal Soul Spears will knock him down again and then repeat the process. With this combo, it was just about possible to finish them off with my final Crystal Soul Spear, but we overcome their Lothricery and pull out the win. So let's clear up some base game optional bosses, starting with Consumed King Osiris. You want to see the fight? Here. 
I do not even feel remotely bad about this. Screw this guy and his no wind up charge. Consume this you bog and bin seeth. I used his soul to buy white dragon breath which I promptly forgot about and never used again. Definitely didn't take my breath away. After grabbing the path of the dragon gesture and showing this NPC invader how to no rope bungee jump, gun deer we are again. The first phase is pretty straightforward, but Pestilent Mist won't help too much in phase 2 due to his constant movement and aggression. I stuck with Crystal Soul Spear, but I took a whole bunch of hits, finding a moment to drink Estus can be quite challenging. Thankfully, Crystal Soul Spear does a lot of damage, so it doesn't take too many hits to bring the champion to his knees. With that all sorted, it's time to try and relax my mind by slicing some giant rats. Oh, and with meditation, I guess. After the ever-exciting Ancient Wyvern fight, seriously, why does this boss exist? I summon a whirlwind of clouds to bring down Nameless King and his flying turkey. After marinating it in a Crystal Soul Spear dressing, Nameless King does a series of slow walks towards me, occasionally interspersed with slow telegraphed attacks, while I pelt him with Crystal Soul Spears, bringing him down in about 8 hits or so. It's felt kinda good to not just rely on Pestilent Mist for these last couple fights, not gonna lie. With all that sorted, and the Lord's Ashes placed, we can take on the final boss of the base game, Soul of Cinder. I was pretty happy to see he chose to switch to his magic form so we could have a sorcery battle, but once he switched back to melee, it's pretty easy to outpace and pelt with Crystal Soul Spear, and same again in the Soul of Gwinda phase. The multi-hit combo spells his demise, and that's the base game done. Just gotta spank the DLC, and we can move to the next cycle. Let's start with the painted world of Ariandel. Quick, a sweetly rotting bed. Although I did die once trying to get down here, I had an insanely lucky survival dropping off the branch at the bottom and managed to beeline to the bonfire. Our first DLC boss is here, an NPC and some wolves. I actually used Soul Greatsword here to handle the wolves, and then actually killed the big wolf first for once as he was an easier target to hit than this projectile dodging ass. Eventually he goes to tend his own grave and we can move onwards to an actual good boss. But first, Sir Wilhelm is a tosser so I embarrass him by smacking him midair with my staff. Obviously the run is completely invalidated but I feel good about myself so who's laughing really? With my schedule Frida up, let's complete this sister act. I decided to boost my damage a bit higher by grabbing the Magic Clutch Ring and the Crown of Dusk, which I hadn't really needed up to this point, but I felt would be handy here. A big problem is that Sister Frida likes to dodge projectiles, so I need to choose my moments to attack wisely. There's certain times which are great to fire Soul Spears, like just after she does her disappearing act. For Phase 2, Pestilent Mist works great for Father Ariandel, as he's such a big target and this doesn't take too long. Black Flame Frida is kind of similar to Phase 1, just waiting until after she's done certain attacks and then firing off Crystal Soul Spear, the jump attacks especially are great for this. With patience, she goes down and DLC 1 is complete. You know what? Let's get right into those bosses, I know that's what you want to see here. Twin demons can actually be pretty tough, a bit less if you kill the demon in pain first though. Thankfully, Crystal Soul Spears take out Phase 1 quite fast, but in Phase 2, their damage resistance increases dramatically. Luckily, Pestilent Mist is unaffected by such things and just takes off the usual percentage of health, but it still ended up being a bit closer than I would have liked. But with one final cast, this boss becomes the artist formerly known as the Demon Prince, because now it's dead. We descend down further into the city and take out some of the denizens here. Yeah, take this. Oh god, wait, I'm sorry. Ah! Okay, you asked for it. Hate those guys. After smacking Midir off the bridge, it was time to take on most people's least favourite DLC boss, half light and the question of course is, as he's an NPC, does he dodge projectiles? You're damn right he does. But there are some opportunities to hit him, as well as some opportunities for him to kill me in seconds. Following a couple of deaths, I managed to kill the painting guardian quickly and then blast down half light, sending him into the full dark of death's waiting arms. Okay, just two more bosses to go. I grabbed some new fashion and headed down to face Midir. In the two or three minutes of research I did for this run while I was sat on the toilet, Everything pointed to Pestilent Mist being an excellent way to handle him. And this was absolutely correct. Dark Eater Mistir's health was absolutely melted by Pestilent Mid, and his large body meant it was easy to keep him in it. I actually went to his back legs for the first time since my initial fight with him all those years ago. He drops, and we can use his soul to buy Old Moonlight, a spell which creates a summoned weapon version of the Moonlight Greatsword, firing a projectile. While this looks cool, 
I tested it against the final boss remaining, Slave Knight Gale, and it was clear that, yeah, this wasn't going to be helping much. So I just stuck with Crystal Soul Spear. This was fine, honestly. I could regale you with the whole story of the fight, but honestly, it just came down to waiting for his attack, jam in a Crystal Soul Spear, and repeat. I didn't bother with Pestilent Mist because he moves around too much, and it wasn't much issue. No time to slaver my victory though, as we've got another cycle to get to. Now, I had planned to start the Miracles run with the Cleric Sacred Chime, but I just couldn't get it to drop from these enemies in the Cemetery of Ash, so I just went with the standard Talisman. And thus began the new cycle, which amounted to a series of terrible mistakes and general bad gameplay from yours truly. You guys are sure in for a treat though. We start with just Lightning Spear as our basic miracle. This was pretty good back in Dark Souls 1, so I assume the same should be true here, right? Well, judging by this damage to Gundir, thus far the answer is no, but then again, my casting tool isn't upgraded. It still wasn't too bad, but it took a while, and I got greedy and smacked at some point. He couldn't be our Gundiro baby, but Lightning Spear definitely kissed away his pain. Moving on to High Wall of Lothric, I noticed something quite curious about Lightning Spear. It actually does a lot more damage if you cast it at melee range, like almost double, which is really weird because it kind of defeats the point of a ranged spell if you're incentivized to cast it up close. I took advantage of this for the upcoming fight with the Doge of the Boreal Valley. Even at close range, our damage wasn't great, and he did actually quite a bit of damage in New Game Plus, so I couldn't avort to make a mistake here. Dodging the multi-charge attack gave me some good openings to lay in damage, and a few more close range lightning spears sends this hound back to the pound. I had nowhere near enough to level up even once, and the New Game Plus consumable souls proved to be very disappointing. I did use some of them though after giving the Mortician's Ashes to the Shrine Maiden to buy the Grave Key, which allows me to free Irina of Karim, our miracle teacher for this run. Any tomes we find can be given to her, but quite a lot of the best miracles aren't acquired this way. Speaking of which, here's our buddy Sigurd. We chat with him, make friends with the BFG, and then drop down in the Road of Sacrifices to get Morn's Ring to boost our miracles and our first miracle tome. We can also grab the Dream Chaser's Ashes again to buy Titanite Shards. I give the tome to Irina, but there's nothing I really want to buy as it's mostly healing stuff, and then I upgrade the talisman to plus three. And it was here where things went downhill. Just want to say right now that the Crystal Sage has become one of my least favorite bosses in Dark Souls 3. Trying to kill him with just Lightning Spear was pure pain, with me often getting ruined by the super high damaging projectiles in the clone phase thanks to Lightning Spear's low damage and slow cast time. I died more than anything else so far trying to beat this damn sage. I can't believe this is the thing that's walling the run. It's annoying because there's more offensive spells behind the sage, but for now, I need to come back to it. What about the curse rotted Great Wood? Well, the damage is even worse, and trying to free aim Lightning Spear to hit the sacks is just awful. I attempted the Abyss Watchers as well, but the damage is just so low unless we're up close. I need to somehow boost the amount of damage we're doing. So I was left with no choice but to go back to the Cemetery of Ash and farm again until after an hour one of those hollows dropped the Cleric Sacred Chime. With this upgraded to plus 8, thanks to some large shards and some chunks I had on me from the previous cycle, I went back to the Abyss Watchers feeling this was the best bet. The damage was still Abyss shocking, but maybe this gave me the confidence I needed or something? I don't know. But anyway, I did a lot better. I played a very patient game, and with not much health left, I nailed one final lightning spear for the victory. Finally, some progress. Killing the Abyss Watchers was especially useful for this run, because it means we can access Smoldering Lake. Remember this giant worm here, the one people think is Solaire for some weird reason? Well, if you stand in the right spot, the Ballista actually kills Salem's Mackenzie for you, and it drops the Miracle Lightning Stake. Finally, a new offensive option we can use. I was really excited about this, until I saw that it has a 35 faith requirement. I'm currently sitting at 28 faith, so yeah, we're a little way away from this. Thankfully, there is a pretty easy boss here we can kill. Although our damage isn't great, Old Demon King isn't very good at handling ranged attacks, so after a patient 7 minute fight, the Old King's heart gives out, and even a shock from our Demon Fribulator couldn't save him. With this, plus some consumable souls, I'm up to 30 faith, but it's just not really going to make a difference at this point. There's still wall near to kill, but he won't drop many souls, and the Crystal Sage and Curse Rotted Greatwood are a no-go unless I get a big damage boost or maybe access to use Lightning Stake. 
So that leaves me with only one option that I can think of. Because Crystal Sage is too hard, I'm gonna kill Dancer early again. Yes, that is an actual sentence you just heard. As it's considered a late game boss, the soul drop should be significant. Downsides are that the damage is obviously pretty low, and also one mistake and I'm dead. But with ranged attacks, Dancer can be handled fairly well, and after enough patience, it's back to life, back to boreality. <clears throat> anyway, uh, with the souls gathered, I'm now up to 33 faith, and I can grab some more Titanite chunks, which, with a grab I slabbed earlier, I can get my chime to plus 10. So now, to hopefully finally get up to 35 faith, we go take on Osiris the Consumed King. Also, before you say it, yes, I know I could have got Yol to level me up a few times by killing myself, but I'm sick of looking like a shriveled ball bag. Anyway, Osiris takes some good damage from our lightning. The only thing that's a real danger is the charge attack with its minimal windup, which hurts, but I can just about survive it. Also, I'm getting a bit annoyed at how rubbish Lightning Spear's range is at times. But in the end, I manage to maneuver myself just under him to land the finishing blow, and I remove him from the Osai roster of bosses in the game. With this, we can now get up to 36th faith, and we can finally use a different offensive miracle. Lightning Stake seems a lot stronger. Might as well test it out on Champy G here. The damage is decent, and Lightning Stakes also makes you duck down at the end of its cast, which, if timed right, means you can duck under some of Gundir's attacks. It doesn't work every time, and to be honest, I did take a beating here, managing to survive just about by somehow going into the menu and popping an ember without getting hit by Gundir. With a bit more good timing, the champion suffers another defeat, much to his Gundir irritation. In the dark version of Firelink Shrine, we can also buy the Priestess Ring, giving us a further 5 faith. Things are finally starting to look up. With this ring, and leveling up from Gundir's souls, we're now up to 43 faith. But the big question is, am I now strong enough to defeat the Crystal Sage? Well, the damage from Lightning Stake compared to Lightning Spear is night and day. The clone stage still presented some challenges, and I did have some lucky escapes, but I managed to push through, get myself healed, and just went in for the kill, finally defeating what had so far been the hardest boss in this run. He had been a Chris Stalwart blocker of this challenge run, but at last I had freed myself from the Cage of the Sage. Before moving on, I grabbed some more Titanite Chunks, a useless Miracle's Tome, and leveled up the Canvas Talisman to maximum for even more damage. It was time now for the Cathedral of the Deep. Or was it? There was actually something in this DLC I wanted to grab first. After this crow guy had some kind of mental seizure, I was able to grab Way of White Corona. I returned to the Cathedral, grabbed another Tome, as well as this casting tool to hold in my offhand to boost cast speed, and then headed to the Deacons of the Deep. Now you might be wondering why I decided to switch to the Canvas Talisman. Well, you see, its weapon art dramatically increases your poise while casting miracles, which is incredibly handy here when these deek heads are constantly trying to smack you and interrupt your cast. Way of White Corona was kind of helpful and did manage to slice through a few of them, but Lightning Stake has an AoE, which was super helpful for these tightly packed hordes. After spamming the weapon art and running out to heal, I was able to bury these guys deep. With most of the bosses on this side of the game taken out, it was time to head to Irithyll at last. Hi Lord Walner. Bye Lord Walner. I also took the time to purchase Gnaw and deep protection from Irina as I hadn't done so yet. I decided to check out Gnaw against Vort's cousin and... It's actually awesome? I think this thing is pretty weak to bleed, but wow that's quite a lot of damage. Guess it makes sense that a dog would be weak to fleas. I plan to head to the profaned capital first, but I remembered at this point that I hadn't progressed Sigwa's questline, so I quickly went and took the steps needed for that, leading to me getting emit force from him here in Irithyll, after which I went and grabbed the Ring of the Sun's Firstborn to boost miracle damage even higher. Down in the profaned capital, there's also a classic Souls miracle, Wrath of the Gods. I free Sigwood from his cell, but now I really want to test out Wrath of the Gods in a decent boss fight. Well, unfortunately, we didn't have one of those, so I went to the Curse Rod in Greatwood instead. Despite Wrath of the Gods having a much longer cast time than in Dark Souls 1, the damage is pretty good, easily bursting his balls with just a couple of casts, and Woody Harrelson goes down on first attempt with Wrath of the Gods. Good to get that one ticked off. Back down the profane capital, it was Yormin time, and as we did Sigurd's quest anyway, he helped us and did most of the heavy lifting. I actually found out afterwards that Yorn's weak to lightning, so I probably could have done this without Sigurd. Oops, well no matter, I'll make up for it later, promise you. Regardless, 
we sent the giant back to his yormitory for a long nap. Pontiff Sullivan is next on the chopping block, and Wrath of the Gods in conjunction with the talisman's superpoised weapon art makes quick work of him. When he's summoning his shadow, it's actually enough time to cast Wrath of the Gods twice, both killing the shadow and damaging him at the same time. Towards the end, I really thought I was going to die, but I just kept going for Wrath of the Gods and somehow survived and won. This miracle was a real pontifference maker here. It was at this point that I became aware of another miracle in the area. By killing this evangelist, we can now get Doris's gnawing, which sounds like an old grandma biting on you with toothless gums. But more on this later. The miracle, I mean, not the grandma thing. Anyway, I kill Yoshka for her talisman, which I promptly forgot about until later despite it being the best talisman in the game, because I suck. Further up in Anolondo, Old Fish, Devourer of Cods, takes the bait and gets shocked hard by Lightning Steak, proving that Steak Dinner beats Fish Dinner here in the land of Lothric. We can trade its soul in for the Life Hunt Scythe Miracle, a nod to Priscilla's weapon from Dark Souls 1. This attack deals dark damage and restores some health, but unfortunately, at least against Dragon Slayer armor here, the damage is pretty shocking. That's not even a lightning joke, it's just bad. So Wrath of the Gods it is. He's pretty straightforward, just kite him round the fountain, bait the three hit combo, roll through on the last hit, and use the poise boosted Wrath of the Gods. Rinse and repeat, and down he goes. That's Carmel coming back to bite him. We are really rocking and rolling now, fellas. Up in the Grand Archives, we grab the awesome sounding Divine Pillars of Light, spoiler, it's actually rubbish, and the Sage Ring plus one for either bed and casting time. So remember earlier I said Life Hunt Scythe wasn't great? Well, it turns out for dark damage such as this, it's best to actually use it with a chime that scales with Int and Faith, such as Kaitha's chime. I level this up and test it out. Using my plus 10 canvas talisman, that's 464 damage. And with Kaitha's chime, that's nearly 800. That is a huge difference. Okay, so different casting tools for different miracles, it seems. Well, let's get some more optional bosses sorted as we head off to Peak Dragon Arch. Ancient Wyvern seems like a good target to test out Doris's gnawing on, and wow I have been sleeping on this miracle. It has a pretty low FP cost, great range, and it procs bleed very quickly, bringing down Ancient Wyvern in about a minute, which is pretty wild. But as good as it was here, it was even better against Nameless King. King of the Storm, when struck in the head, would sometimes bleed instantly from it, taking off 900 damage and Nameless King took two of them for the bleed, but that totaled about 1400 damage. He was easy to hit with them, and in about two minutes the fight was over. This miracle was actually insane. I think Doris might have to become my normal strategy for the rest of this run. Unless they're immune to bleed, of course. With Nameless King's soul, we can get Lightning Storm, which I guess is like a prototype of Ancient Dragon Lightning Strike from Elden Ring, but sadly it's nowhere near as good, and there are better Lightning Miracle options for us. Lorien and Lothric had posed a challenge in the sorcery cycle, but here it was a lot easier surprisingly. In phase 2, it's pretty easy to use Doris to take down Lorien as he knee walks towards you, but for phase 2, Lightning Stake works better as it does more damage and sometimes can hurt both of them. Thankfully, it still takes less FP than Crystal Soul Spear did in the sorcery run, so I had ample FP remaining. After just a couple of defeats of Lorien, the younger prince had taken enough damage and one final lightning stake ends this fight pretty lothrically. As for our boy Soul of Cinder, well unfortunately for him he is vulnerable to bleed and good old Doris just absolutely rips through this fight. I call this the Hemoglobin strategy. I just can't get over how good this miracle is. This was probably the easiest Soul of Cinder fight I think I've ever had. If he does the multi-hit combo in the Gwyn phase, you better believe he's taking... But anyway, down he goes. With his soul, we can buy Sunlight Spear, the strongest ranged lightning miracle we can get, which will come in handy for sure. Back in the painted world of Ariandel, I eviscerate the vile Wilhelm, get relentlessly chased by a wolf, somehow make it down the branches first try, bully the grave tender into a tender grave, and give this giant wolf an internal parasite. It only takes one Doris to bleed the wolf, so this fight goes by pretty quickly. But what of Sister Frida? Well, she can be bled with two Dorises, meaning she goes from Sister Frida to Sister Bleeder. Actually, wait, that sounds pretty gross. Anyway, Father Ariandel is even weaker to bleed, so it only takes one cast to bleed him out. For that tiny FP and the quick cast time, we do over a thousand damage a hit to him. Black Flame Frida dodges a bit more, but is still pretty weak to bleed, so although more patience and dodging is required, this doesn't present too much issue, and with that, DLC 1 is complete. 
It's pretty wild how much this run has turned around compared to when we were slumming it against the Crystal Sage. Well, let's get the Miracle Run chinned off. The Twin Demons are first, and again the biggest challenge is the Demon Prince's massive damage resistance, but much like Pestilent Mist was able to circumvent this in the Sorcery Run, Doris is able to get around it here because Bleed takes off a percentage of health. Although the initial damage of the Miracle isn't much, the Bleed more than makes up for it. I think I see why they made it so that Bleed takes more to proc each successive time in Elden Ring. This is almost silly how much damage you rack up quickly. With Faith now up to 59, I ignored this Reprobate after our encounter last cycle, made this Knight moan in agony, showed this Dragon the force power of my mid-ear Chlorians, and grabbed a nifty speedy lightning attack called Lightning Arrow, something that I wish I had been able to get much earlier in the run, but hey. Just because I could, I actually killed this dual greatsword wielding Ring City Knight up ahead. These weapons look pretty fun, probably should give them a go sometime. As for Half-Light, he was still the worst DLC boss in the game and maybe ever. His ability to constantly dodge projectiles is matched only by his ability to spam attacks relentlessly in a really obnoxious fashion. He should probably be called half assed because that would be relative to the amount of effort put in when designing him. I honestly felt like I got lucky because at the end, he just decided not to dodge my Dorises, so he died. Good, I hate him. With 60 faith under my belt, I could now consider leveling up stuff like endurance and health. There was also no need for the Priestess Ring anymore, so I swapped that out for the Prisoner's Chain. So, onto the true fight with Dark Eater Midir. He's immune to bleed, but is supposedly weak to lightning. I found the damage from Sunlight Spear pretty underwhelming, and I actually ran out of FP, but then I remembered that Kaitha's Chime is better spec'd for dark damage, and I had Yorska's Chime, which I'd completely forgotten about. Even though this did boost my damage, it was clear that I'd need the extra damage of casting the Lightning Spear at point blank melee range as opposed to long range or mid ear range. So, this was basically a melee fight. Stay in front of his head, wait for him to finish his combos, slam in some Sunlight Spears, rinse and repeat. With one final Sunlight Deer, Dog Eater Miss Spear goes down. Round 2 with Gale is about to begin, after one of the most epic shots in the series of course. Gale's damage compared to New Game seems to have increased quite a bit, but thankfully his HP is pretty similar. It's actually a weird thing I noticed, a bunch of the later game bosses get a very minimal HP increase going into New Game Plus, but in New Game Plus Plus, the increase is quite significant. Gale can be bled which is great, but the damage from Doris's initial attack is much weaker than with other bosses, especially in Phase 2 onwards. It's still a solid and safe strategy due to its range and quick cast speed, but it takes a lot longer than most of the other bosses we've used this strategy on so far. But I feel like I know his moveset well enough by this stage that I can be patient, find the openings, and after enough hits, this fight ends in his gale yet to defeat me. Sorry, Slavey. So, after a real rollercoaster of a cycle, we can move on to the pyromancy section in New Game Plus Plus. Definitely the school of magic I'm the most familiar with in Dark Souls 3, but how will this increased health and damage of the bosses play into it? Well, we're off to a pretty bad start. I got the pyro glove and the basic fireball, but guess what? The first bonfire in Cemetery of Ash does not give you the option to attune spells, and I didn't do it before moving into the new cycle. This is, seems really stupid. Why doesn't this bonfire give you that option? Okay, I mean it doesn't matter much on your first playthrough, but for New Game Plus onwards, that strikes me as being pretty damn important if you're a spellcaster. So, does this mean I've ruined the run? Well, not exactly thanks to the Pyro Flames weapon art, which is Combustion, a quick burst of flame in front of me. So I just got to beat Gundyr using only this weapon art on an unupgraded Pyro Flame in New Game Plus Plus. Simple, right? Well, um, actually, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, the damage may look awful, but it's quick, spammable, and manages to stagger him fairly effectively, allowing us to land several more hits. We broke him up real good. You'd see a lot of fractures on his Udex ray. Moving on to Firelink, I link myself with some fire, equipping Fireball as I had originally intended. Our number one priority is getting to Undead Settlement, so let's take care of Vort right away. I thought for some reason he'd take more damage from Fireball given he seems to be Frost Elemental, but the damage seems quite average. By this point, I could probably dodge his moves in my sleep. Luckily, he didn't have any Vorter to put out our fire, and after a few flaming hot balls, he goes down. After descending down to the Undead Settlement, we can now free Cornix the most important early game NPC when it comes to pyromancy, as he not only sells some pyro spells, but also is able to upgrade our pyro glove. So after getting the Dream Chaser's Ashes once again, and buying Titanite Shards, 
we can upgrade the Pyro Flame to plus 4 with what we've got on us. We can also grab the Great Swamp Pyromancy Tome and change into the classic Pyromancer armor. With the Tome, there's hosts of different Pyromancies we can buy, so I purchase almost all of them right away. I mean, we've got the Souls, so why not, right? I take Fire Orb, Bursting Fireball, Great Combustion, and Poison Mist with me. In a step we didn't take in the previous two cycles, we stray this Slay Demon because his soul can be used to buy the Boulder Heave Pyromancy, which will be really important later on. But of course, to be able to do that, we need to take out our old friend the Curse Rotted Greatwood. As you'd expect, fire does a lot of damage to this tree, and the combination of quick flame throwables like Fire Orb and the spammable melee potential of Great Combustion means we can quickly turn this into a bonfire of the Vanna Trees. With Boulder Heave now up our sleeve, I decided to see how we'd do against this demon here. We actually do way more damage than I thought we would, and with Sigurd's help we managed to... With Sigurd's help we managed to take this demon down. First try. Yeah. Crystal Sage. I was pretty nervous about this given how he'd killed us more than any other boss so far in the Miracles run, but this was weirdly a lot easier. I think because of the speed of being able to throw fireballs or using great combustion, but I actually got through this second try. Poison Mist also helped to whittle down its health, and our Great Combustion Spam causes this boss to Sage Quit. I'll be pretty happy not to fight this boss again anytime soon. After definitely not cheesing whatever the hell these things are, I continue my mission which in this case is to kill the old Demon King as soon as possible, which in turn means we gotta kill the Abyss Watchers. Fire Orb does good damage, but my play was a bit sloppy to be honest. I ended up with no healing Estes left, and the Watcher still had about a quarter of his health. I didn't want to face the shame of not first trying them, so I was mega patient and waited for just the perfect moments to attack. Our first Lord of Cinder on this final run has fallen, and we can proceed. While dropping the bridge here, I managed to help these skellies practice their bonji jumping. Shame we forgot to give them ropes. But I mean they're skeletons, it's not like they can get more dead, right? Before heading down to Smouldering Lake though, I actually went to take out Walnir Automata by asking him to be or not to be, and in fact he chose not to be. Killing him was important because his soul can be traded for Black Serpent, a dark damage dealing pyromancy. Before heading to the Old Demon King though, there's actually a whole heap of stuff for pyromancies in Smouldering Lake, including the Old Witch's Ring to boost pyromancies, some large titanite shards to upgrade our pyro flame to plus 6, the Isolith Pyromancy Tome, the Toxic Mist Pyromancy, and the Quilana Pyromancy Tome. With this all in hand, I attune Poison Mist, Toxic Mist, Black Serpent, and Boulder Heave. My strategy for the old Dingaling was a simple one. First, get in close and hit him with both Poison and Toxic Mist. Then, create distance and blast him with Black Serpent over and over again. The damage is pretty decent, and he doesn't really have any ranged attacks which aren't easily avoided. I used a bit of Boulder Heave at the end just to really rock his world, and now the fun can really begin. The old Demon King Soul can be traded in for Chaos Bed Vestiges, a pyromancy most prestigious. I also purchase Chaos Storm and Great Chaos Fire Orb after handing in the Isolith Tome to Cornix. A minimalist setup of Toxic Mist, Chaos Bed and Chaos Storm should do us for now. These enemies on the way to the Deacons go even crazier than usual trying to get through my door iframes. This always cracks me up for some reason, look at these guys. As for the Deacons themselves, I used Chaos Storm a few times just for the visual of them getting bounced into the air, but it just wasn't quite nailing the damage of Chaos Bed Vestiges, which just mows them down and is so fast to throw. The cast interruptions from them can still be annoying, but in the end they just can't compete with this offensive power. It's weird to be so positive about something Dark Souls related that involves the words Bed and Chaos. While we're here, I go speak to Patches and buy Sigurd's armor, saving him from his fate in that hole in the ground. Well, well, well. Now, because there's absolutely no reason not to, why don't we do Dancer early yet again? Dance surprisingly, the damage is wild, and this boss here actually falls in less than 60 seconds. Hey Tiny Dancer, hold this closer. Then, it's just a quick matter of grabbing some chunks, and with a slab acquired earlier, we can now max out our Pyro Glove. There's actually also a ring I'd forgotten about, the Fire Clutch Ring, which gives us an even higher boost to our fire damage. Now, we're pretty much at max power, so the rest of the game's enemies are likely running scared. To give you an idea, watch how this encounter with the epic doge goes. I met up again with our boy Sigurd, this time just for a quick toast, and then I decided to burn these dogs alive because I absolutely despise them. I unlock the shortcut, but I'm actually going to head down to Irithil Dungeon first. 
After finding out that Prison Ratatouille is actually disgusting, I free Carla who is the other NPC we can give tomes to. We can buy Blackfire Orb as well as a few others from her, but that's the most notable. Now here, I was really debating what to do first, and just because I want to diversify my routing, I decided to go to Archdragon Peak. I was pretty sick of these snake guys given my history with them, so I decided to give them a solid murdering. Ancient Wyvern was pretty easy, maybe less so than the Miracles run just because of the shorter range of Black Fire Orb, but Toxic helped out, and shortly after, this Wyvern is ancient history. So there's not really any point messing around. Want to see Nameless King get absolutely crushed? Here, enjoy. Two minutes, done and dusted, both phases, Gwinner, Gwinner, flying turkey dinner. Now, returning to the profane capital, I grabbed the old cell key and also bought Lloyd's shield ring. But as I am sometimes prone to do, I made a last second change. I'd fully planned to use Sigurd to best Yorm, but I decided given my error regarding this fight in the miracle cycle that it might be good to change up the Yormula. So I decided I would beat Yorm here on New Game Plus Plus just using Pyromancy. I mean, it's not like Yorm has that much more health than normal new game, right? Wait, what? Actually, my first attempt proved that this was mostly possible with just Black Fire Orb. I actually only died here because I ran out of FP near the end, but that was something I could rectify. I mean, the other issue was that in Phase 2 he can also one-shot me even with Lloyd's Shield Ring, so I guess I just need to do some of that getting good stuff. The best strategy was to lock onto and aim for the head. After enough hits, it staggers Yorm, and hits to his head during this stagger do a lot of damage. I'm talking 3000 plus. The difficulty is that he moves his head around quite a bit, and it's easy to either not get the fireball high enough to hit the head, or have it sail past entirely. If it hits the arms, it also does decent damage and helps contribute to the stagger, so that's something. It was a long fight still, but I managed to get enough staggers for the damage to add up, and this giant falls in probably the toughest fight of the Pyromancy run. So now for the part where I quickly list some bosses I killed with some bad jokes thrown in. First, I sullied Pontiff's good name. Aldrich devoured several vestiges in rapid succession. I introduced the Dragon Slayer to some Armageddon. Osiris consumed until he was doomed. I shot fireballs at the side of the champion's head until he had Gundir ache. I turned the Crystal Sage into the Fire Sage. And I turned this prince into Fried Lothrican and said this is the way to the Mandalorian before hitting him with my Death Star. With the Cinders of the Lord also nicely offered, I moved on to Soul of Cinder for the final time. Annoyingly, I would have done this first try, but I was a little too close to him in the Gwyn phase when he started his combo, and he Gwynished me off quite quickly. He resists fire, so our Chaos Bed doesn't do as much damage as the other bosses, but it didn't matter too much. He can't do much against the range and speed of our casting, so with a little patience, the Soul boss remaining in the base game is defeated. There's probably just two bosses of the remaining six that I think will prove difficult, so let's see how we get on with DLC number one. If you can wrap your minds around this, I somehow again made it to the bottom of the branch drops on the first try. For the Grave Tender fight, I decided to toxic him because he deserves it, and he actually died off screen, which I was pretty happy about. And then five or six Chaos Bed Vestiges bring down the Grave Wolf Great Tender. On the way to Sister Frida, this Crovarine guy decided to be an absolute tosser, so I took him out. This guy took almost as many attacks as some of the bosses in the game, and proved to be way more annoying as well. I hear he delivers presents to the creatures of this land as well sometimes, that's why he's Santa Claus. With Sister Frida, it's pretty obvious that fire will do well against her, and by this point I knew the windows to attack during Phase 1. Father Ariandil is mega weak to Toxic in Phase 2, so that helped to chip down the HP there. Maybe she should have thought about unstrapping him from the chair if the plan was for him to help with the fight. As for Black Flame mode, these recent runs have really helped me to learn this fight a lot, and where before I used to find this pretty intimidating, I now know where the windows to attack are, and of course our high damage helps to Frida the sister from this mortal coil, completing the first DLC, and allowing us to enter the home stretch of this marathon run. So, onto the... Oh, what? You want some? Ah, die, die, die! 
Uh, okay, that's, that's out of my system, I promise. I've heard it was appropriate to kill Pyromancer Zoe here, even though I don't think I'll have any use for the Flame Fan Pyromancy at this stage. Especially up against this next boss. After barely making it to the bonfire, I had to decide how to handle the Twin Demons. They were immune to Toxic and strongly resistant to fire, so Black Fire Orb or Boulder Heave were really the only options. I figured Black Fire Orb was the best option due to its range, and I also went and grabbed the Dark Clutch Ring to increase our damage. If you're wondering why I didn't get this for Yorm, it's because I felt like I wanted to have some survivability there, and definitely not because I completely forgot it existed. This was pretty challenging actually. Their attacks do a lot of damage, and Black Fire Orb doesn't do that much actually, especially in the Demon Prince phase. I actually got him one hit away from death and tried to go in for the kill when I should have dodged. I paid for it. Should have stuck to my principle of caution. I think this was the longest fight of any across this whole run, clocking in in about 10 minutes. These bosses get a much bigger boost in health from New Game Plus to New Game Plus Plus compared to just New Game to New Game Plus. God, that's a confusing sounding sentence. Okay, looking at it, it might not seem like a huge increase, but you've got to remember Demon Prince's monster damage resistances. Luckily, with enough hits, I can stagger him, which gives me an opening for a few free shots, providing I have the FP at the time to take advantage. I was a little worried I might run out of FP, but luckily I got the stagger right at the end and nailed Demon Prince in the face to bring this tough boss down. Okay, you know what? I'm sick of this guy's attitude. As it's the final time, let's teach him a lesson once and for all. Yeah, eat fire you- Oh god, why, why, why? <clears throat> It's fine, I'll let it that out in post, sure no one will notice. Half Light was still a projectile dodging little toss bag, but the speed and size of Chaos Bed did make this a bit easier than before. I pretty much just kept spamming it at the end, and thankfully, he didn't dodge very much. I'm honestly glad I didn't have to come back and fight this guy again. I've really come to think he's the worst boss in this game. Seems like a precursor to those annoying projectile dodging NPCs from Elden Ring. I'm sure glad I won't be doing a run where I have to fight the NPC bosses in that game with projectiles. Now, what about Dark Eater Midir? Neither fire nor dark will do well here. But, thankfully we do have one pyromancy that does physical damage. Boulder Heave. This is its time to shine. Things were a bit rocky at points, but the damage was meteor than you might expect. I used my usual strategy of aiming for the head. Boulder Heave doesn't have great range, so I do need to be pretty close to land it. Midir has several attacks where it's pretty easy to roll at the right time and get yourself in just the perfect position while he recovers from the attack. Late in the fight, Midir ties himself out with the super laser and also gets staggered after enough headshots, both allowing us to land several free boulder heaves and finally, about 8.5 minutes later, Midir gets booped on the nose and Dark Eater becomes Dirt Eater. For what will probably be the final upgrade of the run, I push in a couple more points of endurance and prepare for the final battle. Gale has a lot of HP here, and Chaos Bed doesn't do as much damage as I'd like. Thankfully, a bit of Toxic helps to bring that HP down and... Well, here, just watch this. And that's it. The run is over. Do you know what? I actually think this was easier than the Dark Souls 1 variant. Yeah, sure, the Miracle Run was pretty bad during the first half, and those fire-resistant bosses in this part were pretty solid, but there also wasn't anything that felt as BS or RNG-dependent as the Four Kings in those later cycles. Plus, being able to actually restore spell casts allowed a lot more flexibility. In any case, I don't really agree with the sentiment that magic isn't good in this game, I think this showed that any of the schools of magic can be good, it's just some take a little while to get the most powerful offensive options. But in any case, if you enjoyed the video, how about leaving a comment below telling me that my routing was terrible and there were loads of things I did wrong. You can also hit the subscribe button to be notified of new content. Next up is Elden Ring Throwing Knives Only, which features one of the toughest boss fights from any challenge run I've ever done. Until next time, thank you for watching, and also for just being a great audience. I've been JK Leeds. Have a good one, and see ya.